That was a massive upheaval. When the particles went from being individual flecks to being trios, and those trios were protons and neutrons, that was a giant step forward. The cosmos is always going through giant steps forward, and we're probably in the middle of one of them, but it's very hard to see the giant step because we, we because the cosmos is filled with so many of them, and we've been bacteria and we are the fastest working researchers and developers on the planet. Gazelles uh, don't don't tend to research and develop. Uh, baboons do a little bit more research and development, but bacteria come up with entirely new morphs in 20 years. They come up with entirely new forms of metabolism, new ways of doing chemistry in 20 years. They come up with ways of eating stuff that we regard as utterly useless except to build buildings, granite, and they turn it into biomass. They turn it into fuel. They take uh, the dr drugs that we throw at them, which we stole from them to begin with. They're the chemical weapons, bacteria, or microorganisms used in their mass wars with each other. But that's our antibiotics. And, and every antibiotic we've thrown at them, they've researched and developed their way around. They are really fast. And one of the points in Global Brain is that we multicellular creatures have taken a long time to catch up with the speed of our bacterial ancestors. And we're only beginning to achieve that speed now. It's a race between us and them. We're able to work as fast as they can on research and development. Because we had the disadvantage of nuclei and, and cell membranes to overcome, but now we've started to wire things together right, to get exactly. back Exactly, and I, I wish I could explain that, but it's a complicated idea. Yeah, we, the bacteria share their information. And because they share their information, they can work real fast. They share their bacterial, I mean, their genetic information. They are willing to swap pieces of genes, and when they aren't willing to swap pieces of genes, they have it done for them by plasmids and, um, and, and viruses and other splicers and dicers. Mm -hmm. um, we came up with a new form of gene that made multicellularity possible. And that gene is uh, it's a very complex, very big genome, and it is locked in a vault. Yeah, but now we're, we're swapping memes at a hyper-accelerated rate. You got it. But, but the, the irony is that three and a half billion years ago, bacteria were already doing this by swapping genetic material, which is storage information. Mm -hmm. That stores information on their collective experience going back a long, long way. It's their form of culture. It's their form of collective memory. And it has taken us until three, three billion years later to catch up to their form of collective memory with our form of culture, which is memetic. We finally have a part of our body that's dedicated almost exclusively to change. And that's an overstatement. Um, but the brain, and especially the, the neocortex, and it's not devoted almost exclusively to change. It's devoted to stability 99.9% .9 of the time. But fortunately, in that 0.0001% of the time, it is devoted to coping with change. If we were devoted to coping with change, John, right now we would not be just looking at global warming and imagining that by sacrificing things to Mother Nature, which is an old human pattern, the Aztecs did it, 8,000 sacrifices a day, um, didn't get them anywhere. Um, that sacrificing is not going to do it. I mean, we, we are part of the, plant, the family of DNA. We are part of the family of life. That family of life started out as less than a teaspoonful of biomass in a, in a cosmos where biomass had never been seen before and was virtually impossible. And it went from a teaspoon to being, I've got to figure on how many tons of biomass there is in the computer, and I don't have it readily to mind. But it's a small fraction of this planet. And the task of biomass has always been recruit as many inanimate atoms and molecules as you can into this grand experiment, this astonishing new form of form um, called, called biomass, called life stuff. And bacteria do that brilliantly, but the amount of, the, we have 1.03 1 sextillion cubic meters of unused resources beneath our feet. And whether something is a resource or not depends on your perception of it. Bacteria are perceiving it as a resource, so bacteria called chemoautolithotrophs are sitting two miles between beneath your feet and mine right now, turning granite into biomass. And we are claiming that we've used all the resources on the face of this planet. <laughs> blindness. Utter blindness. We scarcely used a thing. And we haven't taken life off this planet. If there's anything that differentiates us from bacteria, it's this. Bacteria can outthink us. Bacteria can outcreate us. Hard as that is for us to believe. But we are the only species capable of taking life 
to other planets. And because there have been 142 mass extinctions, it's an obligation because life is fragile so long as it exists only here. And our job is to continue the greening of the cosmos, the process that bacteria began when they went from a teaspoonful to a planetful. But even then, we're still, life is just a very thin film on the crust of this planet. And life deserves to be far, far more than that. And if we fail to take up our obligation to take life further, shame on us. We won't survive. Well, I have nothing to add. <laughs> well, so I mean, what I'm talking about here is we, there are two kinds of space that humans open as new frontiers. There's virtual space, cyberspace, and we've been opening virtual frontiers for a long, long time. When we invented, when we invented language, we invented a new cybersphere. You know, language doesn't ex it exist in a few um, pulsations of molecules through the air that are then interpreted by a zillion different parts of the brain to be what they are. They're insubstantial. They're not matter. They're, they're something left. They're something else. They're a virtual reality. When we invented, when Daniel Defoe invented the novel, um, he invented a whole new kind of virtual reality. How could you tell it was a virtual reality? Well, have you ever spent, when you were a kid, did you ever get so involved in a book that when your mom called you down to lunch, you didn't want to hear her voice because it was interrupting your total absorption in the world of the book? Absolutely. Well, that's a virtual reality, and we've had it ever since Daniel Defoe. We had it earlier than that with things like uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, Alexander the Great used to carry the Odyssey and the Iliad with him everywhere he went. Didn't everywhere. he just have a poet to recite it to him? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But the fact is that, that books made virtual reality so astonishing that it defies belief. And there's something I call the infrastructure of fantasy. Once upon a time, and it's very, very important, it's the reason that Alexander the Great carried around those books and that he was able to achieve all that he achieved, because he carried infrastructure of fantasy. Because in the Iliad and the Odyssey, he had read about certain kind of grand exploits, and he had come to life in a, a world that had changed dramatically um, in, in the uh, 500 years since those two books had first been recited. And he tried to instantiate the old rules the rules of the Iliad and the Odyssey, in the world of his day, which was a much more sophisticated, advanced world. And so he made an empire far larger than the guys in the Iliad and Odyssey could ever imagine by trying to repeat what they did. And that's what we humans do. We grow up on old dreams, and they come anew in our lives because we're alive in a new world. And on the basis of that infrastructure of fantasy, we carry the future within us, and we eventually make it real. And the infrastructure of fantasy is still there. Um, it worked with Jules Verne's novel. Do you know what Jules Verne's novel, Earth to the Moon, accomplished? It, it was about a giant cannon that had been invented at the end of the Civil War. That It was a real cannon that could uh, launch, that could fire shells the size of a Volkswagen. And Jules Verne imagined what you could do if you could fire these a shell like that with human beings into it at the moon. Well, I'm sure many parents, seeing their kids reading this book, in 1870, God knows what it was, 1872 or so, said to their kids, why are you reading that trash? That's impossible stuff. It can't happen. If you ever climb into the mouth of a cannon, I'm going to shoot you because you're going to blow yourself up. <laughs> and stop reading this stuff, for God's sakes. It's taking you away from the classics. Where's your Latin homework? Um, well, what happened with this book is that it inspired two guys, a guy named Oberth in Germany and a guy named Silikovsky in Russia, who grew up on that book and dreamed of a future based on that book. And we're so obsessed with that future that each of them wrote the same sort of book. Each of them said, well, what if we put not the explosives in the cannon, what if we actually put them in the back of the shell that we're firing? Sounds ridiculous, right? Do you want to climb into a shell that's got uh, enough explosives to, to blow up a small town in the vehicle with you? It's called a rocket. The Chinese had invented it a long time ago. The Congreve rocket was being used in the War of 1812, so it would have been around for a while. But humans in a rocket? To get into space? Are you kidding me? But Silikovsky and Oberth wrote very serious books about it. And those books formed a new layer of the infrastructure of fantasy. And a couple of kids named um, Werner von Braun and Willie Ley grew up on Jules Verne's Earth to the Moon and Oberth and Silikovsky's book. And they grew up dreaming of a future in which men could take rockets to space. And Werner von Braun was the man who put together our space program. So the infrastructure of 